I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. The Treasurer began the week declaring he wanted a conversation about superannuation. It quickly turned into a shouting match with claims of broken promises and raids on retirement nest eggs. The government has three main aims here. It wants to steer the trillions of dollars in the nation's super funds towards more productive investments. It wants to stop any future raids on retirement savings for things like buying a house. And it's flagged winding back tax breaks for the biggest super accounts, those with more than $3 million. Now, the opposition's gone in hard, staunchly defending tax breaks for the top 1%. The Prime Minister says no final decision has been made, but the course of this conversation appears set. This week, I was joined by Claire Armstrong, Mark Kenny and Bridget Brennan. Let's start with uh, this superannuation conversation. Uh, Claire, based on what the government's been saying this week, who should be nervous? Well, apparently just the 1% of Australians that have over $3 million in their bank balance. But as people have sort of subsequently pointed out to that, if this really is a revenue clawback, revenue raising measure to help the budget bottom line, there's not really going to be much, um, if I can borrow a phrase from a politician, honey, to turn back <laughs> into the budget about a billion dollars, which is obviously not really going to make that much of a dent. Yeah, That's... about a billion dollars if you do what they're suggesting. Well, they haven't actually even said what they're suggesting. Suggesting. So they've sort of indicated they'll be targeting that 1%. Um, Chambers went so far as to say that, you know, and actually if you have over $3 million in your super, the average that you have is $5.8 million. Um, but they haven't actually said whether they're going to be looking at caps, whether it's on contributions or whether there's going to be, uh, you know, you taxed, taxable income effectively as you draw down on that amount. Well, yeah, the, the most likely uh, scenario here would be those who have more than $3 million. Under $3 million, you still get the tax concessions that you currently have, but once you have more than three million, the earnings on those millions is at the, at the, marginal the normal rate income normally tax pay. rate that you normally pay. So it's not like you lose the money, but the earnings on that money would be taxed at the normal income tax rate. Yeah, and I think the government's argument here is what is the purpose of super? What is the purpose of the concessions? The concessions are there to encourage you to save for your retirement. Obviously, if you're getting into numbers like 3 million, 4 million, or 100 million, 100 million as million, is in the case, there's a bunch of yeah, accounts with 100 then, million. Then clearly that's not for your retirement. That is a, an investment vehicle that's getting favourable tax treatment. Mm. So. Um, it's, it makes sense for that to change. This is, this is a boondoggle, let's be clear, but it's one in which both sides of politics you know, find themselves constantly caught up because they make promises not to do something and then, and then they have to look at the sort of policy merits of it and say, this is crazy, which it is. Well, the, the political um, consequences of doing this though, um, Bridget, there's a couple of things here. Having the conversation, you know, floating the balloon as it's, as it's called, letting this uh, speculation run until they announce something is, is, is risky uh, and then there's you know actually landing a, a policy position. How, how much political risk is involved here? Yeah you can tell that um, the Treasurer is trying to tiptoe quietly. Let's have a national conversation about this. I don't know how respectful this national conversation is going to be when we've already heard the, the super crusade, the super wars. Um, you know it's so so mm. charged, such a charged conversation. However, I do wonder whether the Prime Minister and the Treasurer are just looking at the landscape post-pandemic where we've got, you know, a lot of Australians really hurting. Um, the cost of living crisis is huge. It is not going away. And so it, perhaps they think it's the right time to make the argument that this is only going to affect the top end of town. I mean, we've had 11,000 people. Um, you know, is it going to be so hard to sell to people that we're, we're only going to uh, have a select few people that this is going to apply to? Most Australians have a fairly modest superannuation budget um, and you know as, as the Treasurer has said we have massive massive um, priorities for the nation coming up over a number of years aged care the NDIS um, and I think you know after the pandemic a lot of Australians are, are very wise to that um, it's just whether or not they're going to look at uh, reforming the system over a number of years is, is this just the first kind of you know hint of that well it will depend you know, how this applies and if it is just the one percent well you know clearly that's going to be easier for the government to sell than if it's more than that but Stephen Jones um, Claire the, the assistant treasurer when he made these comments you know likening super to a what was it a 
a hive of honey, we need to share honey it around the hive. Honey spread the super messaging is how I... <laughs> what happened there? What happened there? <laughs> well, so he was speaking at this association's conference for self-managed uh, self super funds, the theme of which was hive. And somewhere somewhere along the line, um, and if, if you speak to the people that run the conference, he really took that and ran with it uh, and ended up talking about the contributions that Australians make to their super as honey that should be used for the greater good of the hive. He then, that day, had to walk back saying, you know, that the first, second, third and fourth priority of super is obviously uh, the, the man, like for the funds to deliver the best returns for their members. Yeah. But he, yeah, it's been an absolute mo Most mess. people, He's of course, worry that the money they're putting away, they're required to put away is for themselves, not for sharing around the hive. And it didn't he quite fit with... The Prime Minister's um, efforts, particularly as the week went on, uh, to insist that this was this was only only being targeted. This was not big changes. Was not yeah. major changes are being targeted uh, at the top. Here he was. There's nothing uh, that impacts uh, the sustainability of the system from punters out there who've got one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in their accounts. Uh, you know that that's not uh, a, an issue at all, uh, which is the the average. Uh, we uh, said uh, during the election campaign that we did not intend to make big changes to superannuation, and we don't. Well, he actually said we have no intention to make any changes. We've said we have no intention of making any super changes. One of the things that we're doing in this campaign is we're making all of our policies clear. Mark. Intentions can change once you're in government, but uh, is, is there a, a problem here? Is this a broken promise? Well, you're right to identify the word intention because I guess that's the only real escape here that he could, you know, it was true that there was no intention then. They now look at the books and say there is a, an argument for doing this. So, um, you know, that's, that's the, the, the justification for it now. Oh, but what politicians say before elections matters, right? And well, it does, and the, the currency of trust is is is, is very important one. It, it's absolutely critical, and it's interesting that uh, if we think back to the, the talking about um, changing stage three tax cuts, which was a, yeah. a, a, a another kite supposedly that was that was flown, although the government doesn't think this is a kite. Um, uh, the argument was that it, it, it uh, you know. It was going to, the argument against it was that it was going to happen you know, pretty well immediately after having won an election. Mm -hmm. And that revived fears of, of, of sort of the, the kinds of things that happened in 2014 very shortly after the Abbott government got, got elected. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't get elected and then very quickly start breaking promises. How worried is a Labor MPs about you know, the broken promise charge here, do you think, Claire? I think it's about the accumulative effect that something like this has and that maybe there's um, a way that they can sort of whether this deliver a really targeted with limited impact change to super but there a lot can happen in the next two years of uh, you know Labor still being a government and if you get to 2025 and you've got an opposition that is charging you with you know not having delivered 275 on your power bill having tinkered with super after saying you wouldn't um, you know myriad of other things that can happen in the next two years mm. it's more about the accumulative damage like I think politically that it can do that is starting to get people worried. Well Peter Dutton you know as I mentioned he's gone in pretty hard on this he's calling it a broken promise he's suggesting that the coalition will oppose any change at all here. If you've got kids at the moment who are talking to their grandparents who are on the cusp of retirement, or indeed their parents, then they're going to be saying, well, hang on, why would I invest into superannuation if the rules keep changing and the taxes keep increasing and every time Labor gets into government they run out of money and they start increasing the taxes on superannuation to plug the gap? Well, those, those kids, it's called compulsory super. Yes, yeah, but I don't <laughs> think they'll still have to make those contributions. But um, it's interesting, a couple of weeks ago he was saying he wanted the Liberals to be the party of the working class. Mark... Is he now going to be the party of standing up for the multi-millionaires? Well, I think the calculation they're making... I mean, that's a good question, but I think the calculation they're making here is that uh, it's, it's all about the broken promise and it's all about the idea that, that, that Labor comes after your money, right? So they're looking to sort of leverage the, the, the sort of fear that will be felt by people legitimately who might be about to face a higher tax rate and leverage that right across the whole, the whole electorate. And we saw with, uh, with the franking credits, capital gains tax, negative gearing uh, suite of issues in the 2019 election that you can, you can, in political messaging, sweep up 
a whole lot of other people who aren't actually going to be disadvantaged by a policy change and have that level of anxiety around it and that's what he's going to be doing. Well, exactly. So as Claire says there'll be the whole sort of narrative about broken promises yeah. but there'll also be this narrative that Labor's coming after your money even yeah. though it's it's, it's but it's that blunt messaging that, you're right, has worked in the past. You've got an Aston by-election, a by-election in the Melbourne seat of Aston coming up in about five weeks, Bridget. That, that sort of seat in that part of Melbourne, how do you reckon this issue is going to play? Well, I, I just wonder because, you know, at the, before the May election last year, there were a lot of seats that were surprising the outcomes um, mm -hmm. and demographics are changing. And um, as I said earlier, so many people are really, really struggling um, just to get through get through the mm. year. The re rental prices are obscene at the moment in somewhere like Aston as they are, you know, all around the country. So um, the messaging for the government is really critical once they um, formulate uh, this policy. Is it actually just about them saying, well, the opposition actually wants to protect the top end of town um, and this is really not about your everyday kind of uh, mum and dad with 150,000 in super. So, um, but, you know, as Mark says, the opposition can be really clever with their messaging here on, on saying that this um this could yeah, yeah yeah, yeah exactly. it, it's interesting that top end of town uh, term mm. I don't expect to see that used all that much in this though I mean it, it it it's doing it's running that argument without using those words because those words didn't fly so well in 2019 either no there's also going to be a generational um, difference in how this issue is viewed as well mm. I, I imagine that the coalition would be scoring a lot of points with young people who look at this as super as something that probably doesn't occupy any of their space uh, in their mind. Don't tend to think about it in your 20s. <laughs> not, not a lot, but you do think about buying a house and so yeah. they're going to pivot into that idea of limiting the objective of super as well, which I think they feel will tap into people that don't have a lot of money that want to get into the housing mm -hmm. market um, or you know any of the other sort of initiatives they're pushing for you to be able to dip into your super for. Um, and I think they'll link mm -hmm. that to Labor's, you know, basically saying we don't want people Yeah, it's probably that. a lot of people who are quite surprised that you can have $5 billion in your super <laughs> yeah, account. Yeah. Um, I wish that were me, it's not, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that's so true. There is a generational divide and I think those old rules about the super wars perhaps don't apply to a, to a totally new generation that's trying to get into the housing market. No, 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 and that generational divide can happen in, in, in both ways. It's not just about, you know, uh, young people wanting to use their super, for example, to get into our house, which is the way the Liberals are going. But it's also about, you know, the resentment that a lot of young people have about baby boomers mm. having, you know, huge superannuation mm. uh, accounts, Plus all uh, the big uh, houses. several houses, you yeah. know, all this sort of thing. So, and locking them out of the market. Mm. So it cuts both ways. Well, time to talk to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen, now. And to take us there, here he was as Shadow Treasurer in 2019, describing Scott Morrison's changes to superannuation as a retrospective tax. As I said, the 250 to 200 thousand dollar change. The government changed it from I think 300 thousand down to 250. We we think fair enough, but it should go a bit further. So the government really can't claim the high moral ground. Again, the government said no change to superannuation, and then Scott Morrison as treasurer brought in a retrospective tax. Chris Bowen, welcome to the program. Morning, David. That Morning, everyone. You, that was you back in uh, 2019. Is is what Labor's now considering something you would describe as a retrospective tax as well? No, there were particular elements about Scott Morrison's plan which were backdated, but the key point there is that Labor was backing uh, measures to make superannuation more sustainable or more equitable, and indeed we suggested at that time it could go a bit further. But what we're talking about here, David, is a very sensible discussion led by the Treasurer about making sure our superannuation system is sustainable and equitable, and I've seen you know, Liberals frothing at the mouth at those words, saying how outrageous it is that our superannuation system, we should even consider making it more sustainable or more equitable. I mean, superannuation was a Labor invention to give working people a chance at a dignified retirement. We're very proud of it, we'll build on it, and we will make it sustainable and equitable as well. Let's turn to your current uh, portfolio. The government, of course, need the Greens to pass uh, three major bills at the moment, including your changes to the safeguards mechanism. The Greens aren't happy, uh, as mentioned earlier. They reckon you're making the climate problem worse, in fact, by approving uh, more um, coal seam gas fracking in Queensland. That will increase emissions, won't it? Well, let's look at what we're trying to do here, David, and I'm more than happy to go through the details of particular elements of it. But firstly, let's just lay out what we're trying to do here. What I'm trying to do as the Minister, what the government's doing, is reducing emissions from all our big emitters as a whole. New, old, existing, proposed, 
uh, industrial resources. Now, the Greens are focusing on one particular element, new resources. They can do that. That's OK. But I'm doing something a bit different here. This is the biggest chance the Parliament has had in more than a decade to actually get a sensible framework to reduce emissions from all our big emitters. As I said, anybody who emits more than 100,000 tonnes a year. Now, this is 205 million tonnes of emissions out of the system by 2030. That's roughly equivalent to two thirds of the cars on Australia's roads. So that's a big deal, David. And that's why we're focused so importantly on getting this through. Now, inevitably, when you bring in a big reform like this, a whole bunch of people will say it doesn't go far enough. A whole bunch of other people will say it goes far too far. The coalition have written themselves out of the story and made themselves irrelevant. So we're now in discussions with the Greens. And as I've said repeatedly, if they have good faith proposals, just as we did on other matters before the parliament, the climate bill, EV tax cuts, etc., then we'll work them through. Okay, but and I'll government... come to those proposals. Mm. But mm. just back to the question, opening new gas fields or expanding gas fields will increase emissions, won't it? Well, inevitably, any new development uh, has emissions uh, implications, whether it's industrial or resources, David. That's why I'm so determined to get a framework in place to see those emissions come down. Now, if, if the safeguards reforms don't pass, then there's no constraint on carbon in our biggest emissions, in our biggest emitters. Emissions will continue to go up just as they have since the safeguards reforms were brought down in 2016. But the it's Greens' not point is purpose. you're not really constraining them because all these big companies can just buy offsets. Well, on offsets, David, because we are proposing a pretty ambitious agenda of 4.9% emissions reduction each and every year, of course we are allowing some flexibility because... Well, unlimited flexibility, isn't it? They can buy but, as many as they want. Well, David, when you're looking at the biggest emitters, they have different options available to them. Now, some, some will find it easier than others. I believe emitters will look at the least cost, most efficient way of reducing emissions in their actual facilities, but some will find that hard, like cement, for example. Now, if people want to argue for limits on offsets, they have to show me how an industry like cement could reduce emissions without laying people mm. off or reducing production. I don't want to see Australia making fewer things or investing in, in, in less technology. I want to see Australia making more things and investing in more technology. And that's why this regime that we're putting forward, this safeguards reform, is so important because it takes 205 million tonnes of emissions out of the air. Yes, it provides some flexibility, but mm. when you're embarking on such an ambitious proposal, you should provide flexibility. So why then, alongside all that, do we need new coal and gas projects? Well, um, the Greens suggest that there's this pipeline of automatic approvals, which is just not right. Now, ultimately, David, the Greens need to decide here. No, I'm just... Are they you, a part... I, yeah, can no, I ask about your position here? Yes. We'll, I appreciate you want to have a go at the I, Greens. I, no, Why do I, you think we should not ban new coal and gas? I, I, I will get to that point, David. I just want to make this point. The Greens need to decide. Are they a party of protest or a party of progress? This is big progress. If they want to protest, they can do that. But this is about progress. Now, on okay, new, so why won't on, you ban coal and gas, new coal and gas? Well, on new proposals, David, we are taking our national energy market to 82% renewables by 2030. That's a big lift from where we are at roughly around 30% mm. in 83 months. That's a huge task, but it still means that 18% will come from non-renewables, inevitably. Now, eventually we'll build from that 82, but in the, in the medium term, we are still gonna have 18% of our energy grid coming from non-renewables, and increasingly that'll be gas. As coal-fired power stations leave the system, we're not going to do nuclear. That leaves gas. So and can our you just job say no new coal, at least? Well, our job is to ensure that we have the capacity to ensure that our lights stay on as we make this massive transformation, which is the biggest, industri biggest economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. And do we now, need to do new that, coal mines to do that? Well, David, the only coal uh, matter that has been decided by this government is Tanya Plibersek's decision to reject coal, uh, Clive Palmer's coal mine. I mean, she will continue to do her job in the very passionate, effective and competent way that mm. she has shown in the first but nine, in your year, nine months to of zero, government. zero, do we need new coal? Well, David, the Labor Party is not proposing any new coal mines. So why don't you just say to the Greens, we'll ban well, because, new coal? Well, because we believe in insisting that the regime is, in, is improved so that emissions come down from everyone, all big emitters. At the same time, Tanya's reforming the EPBC Act. 
in line with the Samuel recommendations, which recommended much greater transparency about mm. emissions uh, from uh, approvals. She's getting on with that job. I'm getting on with the job of tightening the safeguards mechanism to actually get real emissions reduction okay, so there into won't the be system. A there won't be any sort of ban or We're any not... sort of time frame as to when we can stop opening up new coal and gas. No, that's not part of our agenda okay. and it won't be part of those negotiations. So on gas, I, mm. on, on gas um, there's also the, uh, the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory and a decision uh, pretty soon, we understand, from the Northern Territory Government about whether to allow full-scale uh, gas uh, fracking there. Last time you were on this program, you agreed if that is to be opened up, it needs to be fully offset, no net increase in emissions. Is that still your position and how is that going to be achieved? Well, and that is the position of the Commonwealth and the Northern Territory Government, which was the recommendation of the PEPA review, mm -hmm. uh, which is what governs the consideration of these matters in the Northern Territory, that there be no net increase in emissions. I mean, both part, all parties are technically committed to net zero. All parties. Technically the Liberals, even though they don't really believe it. Technically the Nationals, even though they really don't okay, believe but on, it. On Beedaloo, the on Beedaloo, if there's going to be no net uh, increase in emissions, will that involve the Commonwealth chipping in to buy offsets? No, well, these are matters for the Northern Territory Government to consider. And, so you know, nothing are, from the Commonwealth? No, that it is, I'm not proposing any particular Commonwealth action in relation to, to, the, to the Beedaloo, no. Because not in relation the Chief to that, Minister, but, Natasha Files, is looking to the Commonwealth to yeah, ensure well, that happens. Th David, these are ongoing discussions, but, uh, you know, as I said, my job is to get emissions down from all our emitters. I, I understand the focus on gas and coal and oil uh, in this discussion. That's very important. Mm. But so is finally, finally, getting a regime in place which reduces emissions from all our biggest emitters. OK, but just, uh, and, sorry, uh, coming uh, back to that question, the Beedaloo Basin, if that opens up, there'll be nothing from the Commonwealth to help offset it. There, there, there have been no discussions between the Commonwealth okay. and the Northern Territory Government about that, no. OK. Uh, well, on the, uh, one of the compromise options that the Greens are talking about, and you, you referenced it, the EPBC Act. This is putting a climate trigger in environmental laws so that approvals have to consider the climate impact before a, a project goes ahead. What do you think about that idea of a climate trigger? Well, David, as I said, uh, Tanya is progressing very important reforms to the EPBC Act, which will be a big step forward. I'm likewise progressing reforms to the safeguard mechanism. The two are if you like, both complementary, mm. but not related pieces of legislation. You, you could have a view, though. Well, my view is that we're getting on with the job of implementing the election mandate we got, which was to implement the Samuel Review, implement reforms to the safeguard mechanism. What about Can a climate not... trigger? Do you think that's a good idea? Um, that's, not, that's not what we're proposing, no. And mm. I believe that the Samuel reforms that Tanya is progressing, which provide much more transparency to this matter, accompanied by the reforms that I'm proposing to the safeguard mechanism, which actually get real emissions reduction. I mean, a, a well, tonne the, the, of emissions the climate trigger is not, not a new idea, though. Way back in 2005, when you were in opposition, uh, a private member's bill was introduced by one Anthony Albanese to introduce a climate trigger into the EPBC Act. If it was a good idea 18 years ago, why not now? Well, we can all go back. I'm not sure what you were doing in 2005, uh, David. I seem to remember I you were doing lunchtime on the, Sky. I, I think was you, you were doing lunchtimes on Sky, and I was a, I was a junior opposition backbencher. So you well, know, uh, Anthony Albanese was introducing a bill for a climate trigger. Yeah. Well, um, the policies that we are implementing are not what we anybody might have talked about in 2005. They're what we've got a mandate to implement in 2022. David, right. That's what we're implementing. Okay. A couple of other things. Uh, Snowy Hydro. I've got to ask you about Snowy 2.0. Uh, the big tunnel, one of the big tunnel boring machines is stuck underground. It's uh, apparently uh, stuck in some soft ground there. It's a little unclear exactly uh, what's going to happen here. A huge hole has opened up uh, above it. The tunnel maybe has collapsed. Can you give us an update about uh, what's going on and, and how you're going to get it unstuck? <laughs> well, uh, I, I won't be down there with a shovel myself. <laughs> what, I will, <laughs> what I will be doing is working very closely with Stowey Management, which is what I've been doing. Uh, as you know, I, I'm not here to pretend to you that I'm happy about everything that has happened at Snowy 2.0 because I'm not. Uh, and it is delayed by at least 12 months and that is deeply disappointing uh, because it is important for the stability of our grid going forward. And when I came to office, one of the first pieces of advice the department gave me was that, that, was that it was running 12 to 18 months late and that had not been made public. Mm -hmm. And I took the decision that that should be made public immediately and that we needed a plan in place to get it back on track. Now, David, I do recognise that this is one of the most complicated engineering projects mm. underway anywhere in the world at the moment. I mean, these tunnels are difficult to build, 
but the previous government made commitments which are not being met in terms of timeline. Uh, the Finance Minister and I have appointed a new Chief Executive, Dennis Barnes. Uh, he knows that very high on his, uh, his KPIs, he's getting this project as, hu as fast as humanly possible. And what's he telling you about this track. machine? How are they going to get it out? Well, um, they're, working on, they're working on all sorts of elements. It's not, not everything as is, is quite uh, publicly presented, but the project well, why is... Why not? Why, why, what's going to happen with this machine? Have they well, told the you? Project, the project, I, I do get regular briefings, David, the project is moving too slowly for my liking. But what, how other... are they going to get this out? Is it some, somehow top secret or...? Well, well, well there's, a, there's an engineering process underway to make more progress with the, with the boring machine. Florence is its name, mm. uh, a, a, an affectionate name, I'm sure, but uh, we need to make more progress on Snowy 2.0. It hasn't been fast enough. There have been other issues with Snowy 2.0. Uh, the government has, by appointing a new chief executive, in effect, asked mm. for a completely fresh set of eyes, a completely fresh approach to what has been a problematic project which we inherited. It sounds like these are underground matters that must remain confidential. Well, I, I, I'm not here to give engineering right. advice to the okay. experts in Snowy 2.0. I am to, here to encourage them to do more. Do you, I mean, you, you mentioned the fact this, these delays keep coming, the costs keep going up. You know, it's well over the cost and the time frame that we were initially told about. Is it time to have an independent assessment, a, a, a reconsideration about the whole project? Well, the project's important. It's a, it's a good project when it's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, so the project will proceed and Im importantly of course we're plugging it into the grid which the previous government didn't do with our rewiring the nation announcements around that. They, they put money into the project, they didn't actually connect it to the grid. But mm -hmm. in terms of an independent review, the ultimate independent review, David, is our new chief executive and that's what we've done. Now I want Snowy focused on that job. I don't want them you know, focused on trying to justify what's happened so far. I want them focused on fixing it. The Chair, David Knox, the Chief Executive, Dennis Barnes, at my request, are focused on fixing it, working mm. closely with the Finance Minister and I. And, you know, uh, we need better progress on Snowy 2.0. I'm not here to pretend that it's all been smooth, because it has not been. Final one, Minister on Hydrogen. On Friday, you met your state counterparts. You, you've agreed to, um, uh, well, the need for an overhaul of the hydrogen strategy, given what's happening globally, particularly in the US. This, this, um, uh, the Biden administration, this, they're pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into hydrogen and other renewables. It is a game changer. There are fears we're just going to be left behind. We'll lose our opportunity for the, uh, the export and jobs boom. Ultimately, will governments have to spend billions more to get hydrogen off the ground? Well, Australia has massive opportunities when it comes to green hydrogen exports. You're right about some of the challenges, but you know, a couple of weeks ago I was in Germany releasing a report with the German minister which showed that green hydrogen exports from Australia to Germany are viable and desirable and feasible and also stood with the German minister, a minister of the Federal Republic of Germany who announced their funding of Australian green hydrogen projects in the Illawarra and, uh, and South Australia. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. You've got a, a Australian government and a German government working closely together to develop Australian green hydrogen projects, employing Australians, uh, because Germany knows and other European countries know they can't provide enough green hydrogen for themselves and Australia is a partner of choice. So yes, I did ask the state and territory ministers to agree with me to review our national hydrogen strategy, which was written in 2019, is now out of date compared to international developments. But I am very optimistic with the right policy settings, Australia can be a renewable energy export powerhouse and green hydrogen will be right at the centre of those jobs and investment. Chris Bowen, thanks for joining us this morning. Great pleasure, David. All right, let's return to our panel. I'm joined once again by Claire Armstrong, Mark Kenny, and Bridget Brennan. Just to pick up on a couple of things there, the safeguards mechanism, right? This is the big negotiation with the Greens right now. It doesn't sound like the Minister's giving much ground on anything. No, well, the Greens' um, ultimatum that's not an ultimatum, it's an offer, is no coal or gas, and mm. we've just heard the Minister say that's not on the table. They're compromised, which obviously... The climate sits, trigger idea. Is, ...is clearly not on the table either. What I actually think becomes interesting here is in the way that Adam Bant has been presenting these ultimatum offers, he said, look, we're willing to put aside all of our concerns with the safeguard mechanism, which range from everything to who can access the bit of money that's been the, put the, on the table. No to limits on the offsets. And... The limits. And it kind of feels like they've dealt themselves out of the conversation around strengthening the preferred mechanism of the government. And to have had all of their chips sort of down on issues that the government has very quickly, quickly ruled out there. I don't really understand 
why they would have said we are willing to put aside our concerns with the safeguard. Um, you know, some of the concerns are like, we'll put aside the fact that Tony Abbott started it. Well, I actually don't really think it's about who started it. It's about what it can achieve and, and how it operates. So I don't really know where Bant goes from here unless he really does... He needs to come out of this with know. something too. Um... He needs to come out of it with something, but I do think that the reason that they've but being so eager to put aside those things and appear to be negotiating is because of the experience with the CPRS. Mm. I mean, that's been such a dominant sort of uh, backdrop, uh, back to backdrop to this debate, yeah. Um, the fact that the Greens stood in the way of the CPRS back in 2009. Uh, here we are, sort of, whatever it is, you know, 14 years later, we don't have any economy-wide mechanism for reducing emissions. This is the, the best shot at... At, at some level of that, but it's not economy a wide of, economy wide, of course. Uh, but I think the Greens cannot afford to be seen to be blocking and wrecking at this stage, and the government knows it. Right? That's yeah. the sort but of the government. But they are blocking and wrecking it if they vote against well, yeah. that. Though. Yeah, but they haven't <laughs> voted against it yet, and uh, that, that's what I'm getting at here. That I think this is uh, this is a very uh, there's, there's some brinksmanship going on on both sides here. Yep. Um, you know, the Greens saying they're going to put aside the fact that Tony Abbott invented it or whatever. I mean, they're not putting aside anything, actually, by saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, kind of underlining uh, the point. Yeah. Um, just quickly on Snowy 2.0 as well. Um, look, none of us uh, engineering experts, unless I've missed a chapter I'll give it in your, your <laughs> career past. But this machine, Florence, uh, it's, it's amazing, right? It's been bogged, basically, in soft earth, apparently, for quite some time. It's unclear whether it did much work at all in um, digging the tunnel. Well, you and, would it's, have thought, and it's very unclear what's going to happen now. Yeah, it is unclear. And you would have thought that they would have done a lot of uh, testing of the soil, of the, of the nature of the geography there, to the geology, I suppose, there, uh, for, you know, to know whether that kind of thing was, was possible. There's been a lot of tunnels dig, dug around the world, and so presumably this is not a novel experience. Um, the way they describe it as a problem having struck soft earth suggests mm -hmm. that they, you know, this is actually something that can be encountered. So what I'd be interested to know is, has the government or has Snowy 2.0, the corporation, uh, been given, a, you know, sort of technical advice now about a time frame for freeing Florence, if I can put it like that. <laughs> I love that it's called Florence. Yeah, <laughs> but big picture, um, it, you know, it, the, the, the minister dismissing the idea of an independent review, we've put a new boss in, that's kind of... And he's clearly not happy with what's happened to date, but they're not about to dump this project that billions have been sunk into already, right? I think it's understandable that you wouldn't want the, them focused on this navel-gazing kind of exercise uh, when the problem is so immediate and they, you know, if att resources and attention are going to put somewhere progress and maybe there's time for some reflection on what went wrong down the track, the obvious exception to that being if the problems are inherent to the project and they're just going to continue yeah. making things worse and it's getting more and more expensive and delayed. So it's... They're going to have to send in another machine <laughs> after the Florence. Or, the or perhaps have machine. one come from the other direction. Uh, all right, let's... they do that with the channel? You know, the, 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 yeah, that's the right, they did tunnel. too. Yeah, Maybe they get started at the other end. Yeah. Let's turn to the voice to Parliament. Uh, we saw another poll this week, a Resolve poll, that showed still um, majority support for the Yes case, but it is continuing to slip a little. Let's have a look at the figures here. Uh, back in, I think it was September, um, it was 60... Uh, no, what was it? 64% back in September, and you can see it's come down to about 58% now. The No case has risen to 42%. That poll also found about 63% still want more information than is currently available uh, on the voice. Bridget, the Yes case was launched uh, during the week. What's their strategy? I think the Yes case and the Yes campaigners, there's different groups um, with a clear um, objective there, will be to be as simple as possible. It's about appealing to Australians on, um, on the reality of the situation that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are facing across this country, which is vast gaps, unacceptable gaps, and, and the, the very clear message that if um, Aboriginal people are able to have a voice to the parliament or to the executive government when that's uh, um, uh, worked out, um, then we can have much better advice coming to the government. So they're going to want to keep this really, really simple. However, I think as the campaign goes on, there'll be a need to be have different messaging mm. to those people that are on the fence that are reluctant or don't quite understand or haven't been engaged in Indigenous, Indigenous affairs at all. I mean, we really are facing um, a long period where we've had very limited Indigenous affairs reporting in this country. Mm. There are a lot of 
Aboriginal people um, who feel very let down by multiple governments across many decades. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of Australian people who are just not engaged with these issues. So potentially they're those people who've moved into the no camp as um, there's been more reporting about different, you know, strands of opposition to the idea. Um, so, you know, uh, as much as they want to keep it simple, I think that is the goal. There's going to have to be um, tailored messaging to a range of Australians over the next few months. You mentioned there the um, whether it's a voice to parliament and executive government or just a voice to parliament. This has been the debate for the last, uh, well, couple of weeks. In fact, it does stretch back well beyond that, but it's, it's come uh, to particularly sharp attention uh, right as we're in the um, crunch point of the government having to finalise the wording that it's going to put forward to, to change the constitution. Um, Mark, just explain to us, if you can, what the arguments are here about the words voice to parliament and executive government. Well, ideally, the, the voice, as it's conceived, would be able to give advice to government and to the parliament. So uh, government in terms of the development of policy and the creation of legislation that would be then submitted to the parliament. The parliament would also be able to uh, have access to ongoing advice, particularly in respect of, say, amendments that might occur to bills and so forth. The argument, though, that has arisen in some quarters, and not in all quarters by any stretch, is that um, if you establish a, uh, a, a constitutional body, a constitutionally enshrined body, that uh, has access to, to the government, that can give advice to the government, and then there are uh, instances where legislation is passed, laws are passed, where either the, um, the, the, the voice institution was not consulted um, or, uh, or, was it, or its advice was ignored, that this would be justiciable, that it would be um, the subject of litigation. People could make appeals to the High Court and say, we have a constitutional right to be involved in this legislation and to have had an impact on it. We were denied that constitutional right. That's the sort of argument. The, the, yeah, the, the criticism is that it broadens it beyond just the parliament but gives the voice remit to advise um, cabinet, well, that, the that, bureaucracy, administrative decisions yeah. and so on now. And there's the scope also of what constitutes matters that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mm -hmm. people as well. Um, Father Frank Brennan's uh, written a book where he's uh, put forward an alternative form of words that takes out executive government, makes the reasons or the arguments why. Noel Pearson and Shireen Morris wrote a, a piece in the Australian newspaper yesterday dismissing this idea, pointing out along the way uh, that way back in 2014, it was a group of uh, constitutional experts, including conservatives and including one Julian Lisa, who's uh, now Liberal MP and the Shadow Attorney General, they all came up with the form of words uh, that, that made it very clear. In fact, I'll read them here. The body shall have the function of providing advice to the parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Well, the executive government is obviously where the key crucial decisions, the final point of where things um, are decided. Mm -hmm. And arguably, there is no greater um, need for um, advice and consultation than that from Australia's first peoples. I mean, if you look at the kind of mess that we're in, if you go to Aboriginal communities around the country and have a look at the state that they're in um, and the gaps, the unacceptable gaps that we have, um, you know, we have an executive government that's predominantly made up of non-Indigenous people. So there is a, a, quite a compelling argument um, that you would seek the advice of those people who know how to do policy and the people that it's affecting. Um, so, and, and that's what's been missing. And we haven't had that kind of consultation. So that's the argument from the yes case. However, there is obviously, as, as Mark explained, um, then that opens up, you know, the potential for um, for, for high court, court involvement. So the referendum Except working the people group... people say it doesn't as well. Yeah, no, I mean, that's right. Look, there are plenty of people yeah. saying I mean, on as, this is as, just a phantom <laughs> argument. Professor Megan Davis said this week, that's how our, our democracy works. I mean, we have to have these... these Whatever these, happens, is going to be a challenge. Right. There's going to be yeah. some sort of court uh, process that follows uh, and, and inevitably. That's right. And there may be ruling from the High Court in relation to yeah. it, which would set out the principles, and probably that would end there. Mm. For the Prime Minister, though, he's got his referendum working group that uh, I think is it tomorrow or in the next few days will provide their final recommendations to him on what the wording should be. Uh, I understand he will meet with the referendum working group again and go through all of that, then take uh, a final position to Cabinet before, you know, it's then announced what the final uh, wording will be. But that's um, not even the final wording because then it goes to... Committee. It then goes to a parliamentary <laughs> committee. Uh, the final wording from the government's yeah. perspective. Then it goes to a parliamentary committee and so on and, and by the end of June we'll, we'll, we'll know. But 
he has this working group that's pretty clear they want executive government included. Um, he's got some of the conservative supporters of the voice saying it, it really shouldn't. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one for him. There were some comments uh, during the week from Linda Burney, the minister. She was on a podcast with um, Patricia Carvelis and, and Fran Kelly in which she made this remark. It will do two things. It will make sure, protected by the Constitution, there will be a voice not to the government, but a voice to the parliament. Not to the government, to the parliament. Look, they're saying no final decision's been made on this, Claire. I'd be amazed if he does drop executive government from the wording. Yeah, I think a couple of things on this. One, even if he does decide to compromise, I don't necessarily know that it's best to do that behind closed doors in Cabinet, that it might be best to take, you know, where the government wants this thing to land to that committee process and have that debate in public where the people that want to engage with it and want to contribute can. Um, I also think that I just don't really know that it's good for anyone involved in the Yes campaign to be talking about this because 90% of the people that they're looking to support them are not going to engage on this granular level. And as that's that's, tr that's probably true, but it's it, it's important for those who have been advocating this from the start that it, that it is both Parliament and, and executive. Well, all the more reason can to I, can, not can, change can it. Can I just make another point about this? Because Noel, Noel Pearson made the point in his excellent piece in, with Shireen Morris in the Australian yesterday um, that uh, none of the conservatives who are who are demanding that this executive government part be removed. Mm are proposing to support it on that basis. I mean, they haven't sort of said, you take this out, we will back. Well, it's a good point, right? So you take out executive government, does Peter Dutton suddenly jump on board? Well, and I think that's what I mean when I say the public isn't engaged. This isn't going to be the thing that switches them from a maybe to a yes or a maybe to a no. no this is the messaging around it will obviously have an impact. But I think it's interesting when you see something like the resolve polling, going out and asking people if they want detail, what does that even mean? Detail about what, when the date of the vote is going to be, what mm. the makeup of it is. I think that this debate around detail is getting beyond ridiculous. We're asking Australians, we don't even know what we're asking them. We're saying, what, we think you want to know more about this, we get that you want to know more about this, but we haven't actually even defined what we're asking what they want to know about. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think that's why the Yes campaign is going to want to get out ahead and lead this conv convoluted yeah. debate over here because, as Claire says, most Australians are not going to be that engaged with... Um, I'm not saying it's not important and it's, it's, uh, certainly the details will be um, imperative to those on the working group, but most Australians will be... Uh, the, the simple question that they will be um, summing up in their minds is, is this going to help Indigenous people in the long run? And it um, needs to be kept that, that simple. And pitch. that's what the Yes campaign wants, but, of course, we've got some multiple different strands of a no campaign it's not that cohesive. I'm not saying it won't be effective, but um, yeah, they're, they're going to come up against a lot of different arguments against yeah. this. And proposal. these things eventually, sorry, just, yeah. just quickly, these things uh, eventually sort of solidify into sort of simple ideas, right? And mm. that's partly the logic here of, of the S case of saying, well, this is a simple principle here, right? Mm. Uh, what the opposition and the, the, the opponents of this are trying to do is simplify it around the idea yeah. that it's complicated, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? And that the complications are being mm. somehow yeah. withheld from you, which of course is nonsense. A couple of other things. Um, we saw confirmation during the week. Real wages have fallen by a record amount, 4.5%. They went backwards last year. Yes, there was wage growth of 3.3%, but compared to inflation, everyone's going backwards. At the same time, more big corporate profits. Qantas posted uh, a record half-yearly profit. Look, they're not alone. A bunch of companies are uh, posting some booming profits. Big retailers, for example. Yeah, big retailers uh, yeah, as sure. well. The ACTU, um, reckon the, the Reserve Bank have, have got it wrong when they're worried about <coughs> wages putting up, uh, putting upward pressure on inflation. It's absolutely crushing for workers. The whole wage price spiral thing was always a fantasy from the 1970s. Instead, what we're seeing actually is a greed price spiral. That's what's happening. This inflation has been driven um, not just by overseas uh, um, supply um, issues. It's been driven by excess profits. Do you have a point? Is it profits that's putting more pressure on inflation than wages? 
Well, I guess you've got to look at the input costs. Obviously, what if this debate has emerged out of some uh, research that the Australian Institute published saying if you factored, if you took a lot of the mega profits, as they're terming them, away, um, that potentially inflation would have remained within the RBA's kind of preferred target rate. I mean, it's not illegal for a company to make profit. Uh, it becomes a bit murky when we know there are supply chain issues and all these other pressures that are fueling input costs that maybe then dropped away or changed um, and de deliver these high profits. But I also think at the end of the day, anyone that's you know booked a flight recently, for example, would be not super happy mm. about mm. the... Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> not super happy about the, the profits the that, profits for example... Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. Said, yeah. um, a, a final one to uh, Ukraine, one year uh, anniversary of uh, the Russian invasion. Australia announced uh, further support, more drones that we're sending. Our military support is now worth more than half a billion dollars <coughs> over 12 months. Mark, is that just going to continue, do you think, that um, resolve from the West? I think it has to. I think it has to. And in fact, I think, if anything, the atmospherics around this uh, have, have sort of hardened, if that's not a contradiction in terms. I think the West resolve, uh, the US resolve, uh, uh, European partners, uh, partners like Australia, the resolve has actually hardened. People realise this is going to take some time. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the behaviour of Putin and Russia and the way it's prosecuting its argument, it's pretty clear Putin's not going to back down. And there is no real way out of this. Eventually there'll be some sort of negotiated settlement. Um, well, China's now um, suggesting some sort of yeah. uh, coming together to talk about a, a settlement here, and Vladimir Zelensky has, has said he's willing to talk to them about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Zelensky's position so far has been that not an inch of Ukrainian soil will be ceded, and they want to move Russia back to before the 2014 boundary, so back before the annexation of the Crimea. Um, presumably, negotiation is going to, you know, involve territory at the end of the day. So it'll be interesting. But uh, there's also talk of China um, actually providing weapons to, to Russia. We know that uh, the Chinese foreign minister uh, met with Putin recently, that, that uh, no limits relationship uh, uh, continues. So it's a very murky picture and it's, uh, it's ongoing and you know we're coming more into what they used to call in Afghanistan the fighting season. And Zelensky is such a powerful ambassador for his country and from the get-go was appealing to nations around the country to be supporting Ukraine. So, you know, he, he really hasn't relented at all in, in um, appealing to, to yeah. you know, his, his global strength, powers. His strength as a leader has been in communicating mm. and he's certainly using uh, that strength. All right, our panel, Claire Armstrong, Mark Kenny and Bridget Brennan will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now, though, for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonists for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, the one and only, the wonderful Cathy Wilcox and a very warm welcome. Morning Mike, good to be here. Um, the climate might be changing Cathy but our commitment to fossil fuels certainly isn't and uh, I did love this Glenn Lever. Uh, I think having reluctant coal would be really useful, don't you? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Come out. No, you'll just set me on fire and cook the planet. Glenn is is so very good at getting into the into the persona of whatever it is he's drawn. I mean, he's you know created a whole character out of Australia, and so yeah. Fiona Katowskis has got them uh, um, watering the burning planet with new fossil fuels. Um, yeah. That's the thing about the Greens, Pete. They can't stop complaining. So yeah. here's Adam Band over here complaining about the world being on fire. And yeah, there's Albo. He's got the got the hose. He can hold a hose. Complaining is really the problem we have in our time. It's it's people complaining about climate change, and that really needs to be, you know, towards zero. I think towards zero complaining, and that'll make the whole thing go much more smoothly. Kathy, you're lovely, uh, Golding. Um, what's your position on climate change? I prefer to talk about the cost of living. Uh, aren't they the same thing? Yeah, well, there's cost and there's cost. So, yeah, you know, that's the main sticking point at the moment. We're not agreed on, on whether the cost now or the cost later. later. Cathy, with its launch this week, The Voice finally found its voice and it was a completely uh, politician-free event, I'm told. Yeah. In Adelaide. Um, so they're obviously trying to take the politics the politicians must have felt really excluded and like they weren't allowed to have a say. You've got a, uh, a 
Terra Nostra. Yeah, our, 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 land. Yeah, um, our land. As opposed to um, Terra Nullius. Terra Nullius. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hi, don't mind us, we're moving in. What the? It'll be great. We've got lots of cool furniture and stuff. Of course, you're welcome to hang with us, but we figure you'd rather live out the back. Mm. Actually, uh, we need some facilities. No problems. We'll get that sorted later. What? You don't like the jacuzzi? Uh, maybe if you'd asked us what we need. Sheesh, you spend a fortune and they're still not happy. Think they're special. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. true. So yeah, true, yeah, Mike, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> except it's just, except, you know, we're, we're, yeah. we, we can tell ourselves all sorts of things like, yeah, they're fine. <laughs> and um, it, we've got a Danny Eastwood cartoon here. He cartoons for the Koori Mail. Oh, he's an Indigenous cartoonist. Yes. Yeah. And um, um, Peter Dutton here has had his voice uh, m muted. Oh, the poor darling, yeah. yes. Albo's uh, telling them, you the National Party and Dutton, this is the time and opportunity to unite our nation for a better future for our country. Say nothing. Says David Little Proud. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a very good the elbow, I like that. It is. Kathy, our political figures may not be heroes, but uh, some of them think they've got superpowers. And it's, uh, it's Jim Chalmers here, David Rose cartoon, uh, superannuation man. Yeah. It's a nerd, it's a fane. No, it's superannuation man. Look, you know, you and me, we're all for the people who are struggling to have a bit of a... A bit of help. So long as, yeah. so long as it doesn't yeah, affect yeah, me yeah. in any way. So long as it, yes. Kathy, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Thanks, Mike. It's been fun. Back to you, David. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations. Bridget. Well, happy World Pride and Mardi Gras weekend. Fantastic to see the Prime Minister walking, um, marching. And, and it was just a really emotional and lovely interview with Jeremy Fernandez, if you missed it, um, on ABC last night. I thought he could have had a bit more glitter on. The, you know, I thought he could have Jeremy just that up a bit. But Jeremy yes. had the sequence. Jeremy looked great, yes. He certainly <laughs> did. Mark. Um, it's said that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And it just occurs to me sitting on this couch, we're talking about the Aston by-election before. It was the very first show of this of, of Insiders in 2001. John Howard appeared on it the morning after the Aston by-election of that year in July of 20, uh, 2001. Um, and Howard uh, regards that as his turning point. Of course, he went on to win two more elections after that. Mm -hmm. But he said at the time, he said, if there was an unstoppable momentum uh, to replace the government, they would have rolled us over in Aston. He, you know, so maybe Aston will be pivotal again, but yeah. probably for Peter Dutton. He saw that as a game changer, that's for sure. Claire? Um, in July last year, I was in Madrid with the PM for NATO, and he said then that basically imminently Australia was looking toward reopening its embassy in Kyiv. That clearly hasn't happened. The Ukrainian ambassador to Australia again calling for that. If it, you know, we're looking for ways to support Ukraine and support Australia's, you know, able to be in that country and assist, then I think that needs to be back on the agenda big time. Indeed. All right. Look, thank you all very much for that. And uh, Claire, your final observation sets us up finally for this one. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the president himself, well, he took questions from the world's media for some two and a half hours to mark that one year anniversary of Russia's invasion. And he did very publicly back those calls from the uh, Ukrainian ambassador for Australia to return its uh, ambassador and embassy uh, to Ukraine. And he even urged that the uh, ambassador could return on a very special vehicle. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. G'day, Mr. President. Most of your allies have reopened their embassies here in Kyiv. Australia has not, citing security concerns. Would you like to see Australia's ambassador return to Ukraine? And if he does not, will it affect relations between Australia and Ukraine? Справа. It's so nice to hear a question that you can say yes to. To shake hand the ambassador of, of Australia, I, I, I'll, I'll do it with pleasure. Please come. Come back. But on Bushmeister. We need one more. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.